Travel writing is one of man's most ancient forms of literature. Like epic poetry, but unlike the novel, it's appeared independently in almost every human civilization. Uh, from the early wanderings of Utnapishtim and Gilgamesh uh, in the early Sumerian epics through the wanderings of the patriarchs of the Old Testament or the Pandava brothers and the Mahabharat, the idea of telling a story through the form of a journey is something that's appeared throughout the world. Uh, some of the greatest travel writing has been done by Arab travelers like Ibn Jubayr or Ibn Battuta. Uh, it's been done by uh, Chinese and Japanese writers like Li Po and Farhesian, uh, visiting the great Buddhist sites of India. Um, a long European uh, tradition of travel writing um, towards the 19th century often tied up with colonialism, uh, with figures like uh, Alexander Burns winning gold medals from the Royal Geographical Society while at the same time spying for Queen Victoria. Uh, and then more recently, post-war, post-colonial uh, period, um, amazing rise of travel writing from other parts of the world. Writers like Pico Ayer, who's going to be our keynote speaker at the Jaipur Mothership in, uh, uh, in January. Um, and uh, Vikram Set, uh, writers from all over the other world, writing back, uh, often uh, uh, from the most unexpected perspectives. And one of the issues I think we will hope to, ha if we have time towards the end of this discussion, uh, that we uh, will address is whether travel writing has a role anymore in an age when everyone travels and when uh, Google Maps can take you into uh, uh, the backyard of any part of the world instantly onto your laptop. Uh, we have an, a, a, a panel which reflects the extraordinary diversity of travel writing today. Um, John Houston, who will start the readings. We're going to each give you a short reading of about five minutes each and introduce ourselves. John Houston, uh, with a variety of amazing uh, Arctic explorations, and, and, and which he will be talking about. Laurie Erickson, um, taking a more spiritual route. Uh, I've done travel books uh, in the Middle East and Central Asia. Uh, Christina has written amazingly, uh, often from the point of view of a journalist, uh, in war zones and uh, tricky parts of South and Central Asia. Uh, and Navtej, uh, from the urbane position of the Indian uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, writing in his, in his uh, uh, rare spare hours uh, from his different postings around the world. Uh, so very different approaches, and I think th the diversity of this panel shows the extraordinary possibilities of the genre, but we'll get on to that later. So we're going to go around each in turn, introduce ourselves, talk a little bit about what we've done, uh, and uh, read you about five minutes each, and then hopefully there'll be time at the end for us to bring it together into a short discussion. John, do you want to start? Well, thank you very much. I got a bit of a tickle today in my throat, so apologies in advance. Uh, I, I'm a polar explorer, and I, I got into that career path by reading about Shackleton and Amundsen and their exploits and thinking, well, if, if people like that can, can do that, well, why can't I do it as well? <laughs> uh, I mean, that's the big thing about reading about tr travel or whatever you're reading. We, we identify with whatever struggles or challenges or the journey vicariously. And I, and I tried to apply that to my own life. I have a, a slide sequence that I'll let scroll in the background as I read out of my book, Forward, the first unsupported American expedition to the North Pole. This is from chapter one, which is entitled, Icy Pants. <laughs> we begin each chapter with a short quotation. This one is, anyone who has never made a mistake has never tried anything new, Albert Einstein. We stand atop a frozen sea that stretches out before us. For the past 47 days, it has been our constant companion and our home. We have skied, snowshoed, and sometimes even swum toward the North Pole, climbing over ridges and threading our way among ice boulders, large and small. In our backpacks and in our Kevlar sleds, called pulks, we carry or haul everything we need to sustain us on our journey, food, clothes, tent, navigation gear, and satellite phones. No Americans have traveled under their own power to the North Pole without resupply. We hope to be the first. 
In the next few days, we expect to begin an all-out race to the pole. We have 103 nautical miles left to go, which is about 125 street miles. A Russian helicopter is scheduled to pick us up in eight days. If we don't meet this deadline, we fail. It is April 17, the spring season on the Arctic Ocean. This morning at five, like every other morning on our trip, we rose from our down-insulated sleeping bags and quietly prepared for another day on the ice. With daylight lasting 24 hours, the tent was bathed in sunlight as we fixed our breakfast by thawing out a block of pemmican, a mixture of meat, fat, vegetables, and spices. A half stick of butter topped off our fatty stew. We have come to love eating chunks of butter and deep fried bacon, <laughs> which I highly recommend. <laughs> Two staples of the super diet that keep us alive. Hauling our heavy loads in this brutal cold means that we need to consume calories at the phenomenal rate of at least 700 per hour, almost four times the norm for a person walking, say, along Lake Michigan on a November morning. Our thermometer this morning read minus 34 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, four hours later, the temperature has risen to a balmy minus 10 degrees. We eat, sleep, and ski. Sometimes we climb over, climb over chunks of ice the size of Volkswagens. To cross short stretches of open water, we, we put on waterproof suits called dry suits and swim through slushy water, towing our floatable pulks behind us. At this moment, my blood is warm and my mind awash with problems, some technical and some personal. We halt at the edge of a lead, a gap in the sea ice, which froze over maybe a day or two before. Floating on the Arctic Ocean are giant plates of ice that constantly move and grind against one another. Stretches of water called open leads are formed when these plates pull apart. Open leads sometimes look like small rivers or creeks with no current. Eventually, these leads will refreeze, but with a thinner layer of ice. I'm staring at the ice in this lead, wondering if it will support my weight with the 100 pounds of gear that is left in my pulk. The, the lead is dark and speckled with frost flowers an inch high. Dark ice is new ice. I hope it will hold us. The ocean below is two and a half miles deep. I punch the ice with the tip of my ski pole. It doesn't poke through. The rule of thumb, if the ice doesn't give after three good jabs, it is usually good, solid enough to ski across. It looks like the same ice we skied over yesterday, Tyler calls out over the wind. It looks good. Tyler Fish is 35 years old, a powerful and skilled cross-country skier and my partner on this 416 nautical mile journey to the pole. A, a ruff of wolverine fur, heavily encrusted with frost, frames his bearded, weather, rather roughened face. His wife, Sarah, and infant son, Ethan, are waiting for him back home in Ely, Minnesota. Tyler and I trust each other implicitly, but lately our relationship has had its tensions. We've known each other for nine years, since our days working together at Outward Bound, the famous outdoor leadership school. Now we are like soldiers marching through a moonscape of ice dependent on each other for survival. Our ability to excel as a team, assessing our progress and mulling over each predicament we face will determine the success of our mission. This morning, after months of simmering and silent complaints, Tyler released his pen up frustrations in a, re in a reflective rant that lasted close to 30 minutes. I listened to him as a friend who knows he should just listen. He's a good man, the clear-headed sort you want in a tight spot in the Arctic. I trust him with my life, and I know that his venting will clear the air and make us stronger. Still, I feel blindsided and a bit distracted. I wish I could just call up my girlfriend, Jennifer, and talk it through with her. Newly, newly frozen leads are exciting but treacherous. We ski up to a lead. It, as we ski up to a lead, it always makes us slow down and think. If the crossing goes smoothly, we're on our way. If we screw up, we're in the ocean in a race for survival. After a few more jabs at the ice with my pole, I agree with Tyler. Yeah, yesterday we walked over ice like this. I'm standing on the apron of newly, the newly frozen lead. Here the ice is white and solid. I shove off and begin to slide toward the dark ice. We always move fast across the lead, so I put some muscle into my stride. 
Right away, I sense that something is going horribly wrong. Puddles appear on the ice. I feel myself skiing downward as the ice below begins to sink. It's as if I'm on an escalator, slowly descending into the abyss. There is no turning around as the water begins to swallow me. I'm glad you survived. <laughs> Spoiler alert, he survived. Um, uh, I'm Laurie Erickson, and I'm uh, reading from my book, Holy Rover, Journeys in Search of Mystery, Miracles, and God. Uh, it's a memoir structured around trips to a dozen holy sites around the world. And I think the excerpt that I'm reading explains a bit more about my biography. I can pinpoint the exact moment my interest in writing about spiritual travel was born. I was browsing a magazine, one full of ads for cruises and articles on five perfect days in Tahiti. But near the back, I read an article of a different sort. It was about staying in retreat centers, primarily monasteries, across the US. The article was a revelation. I hadn't even known that I could stay in a monastery, unless, of course, I was thinking of joining one. But it turns out that such places welcome visitors and that the retreat business is booming for many of them. While the number of nuns and monks is going down, the number of people who want to experience the serenity of these communities is going up. The article reported that such places are often booked months in advance. I looked up from my reading and said to myself, that's what I want to write about. So began my career as a travel writer specializing in holy sites. While I do other bread and butter writing projects that help pay the bills, much of my time is devoted to writing about the many places in the world where people can experience the holy, a fulfilling blend of my long-standing interest in spirituality and my passion for travel. Essentially, what I write about is pilgrimage, which is one of those pious words that scares some people off because they're afraid they're going to have to walk over rocks and bare feet and eat hardtack for six months. It's actually less esoteric than that. Most travelers have already been on a pilgrimage once or twice in their lives, whether they know it or not. When they visited the town where they grew up and walked its streets with a full heart, for example, seeing everything through the lens of memory. Or when they took a trip with a friend facing something big and scary, like a serious cancer diagnosis. And along with the fun was the knowledge of a powerful undertow just beneath the surface making every stop for ice cream and view of a sunset bittersweet. Such trips are pilgrimages because they touch the heart and soul. There's nothing wrong with an ordinary vacation. Sometimes what we need most is a beach, a mystery novel, and a gin and tonic. But at other times, which tend to come after losses and at transition points like graduations, decade birthdays, and retirements, the road calls to us in a different way. Even if we think we're not religious, even if we're skeptical of any kind of spirituality, something in our DNA draws us to wayfaring. I suspect it's part of what first drew our ancestors out of the trees and the savannas of Africa and eventually to every corner of the earth. The sacred enters our lives through the tiniest of openings, often slipping in underneath a door that slams shut. The job ends, the lover leaves, the friendship dissolves into bitterness. Or the call may come through a, the comment of a stranger at a bus stop or in a headline we happen to read at a checkout counter. We tell ourselves we're foolish for listening to that inner urging, and yet we pack our bags and set out. Whether a seeker sets out alone on a deserted trail or travels in the company of like-minded souls, pilgrimage is both an outer and inner journey. Ordinary trips bring a change in scenery. Pilgrimages are meant to trigger a change in heart. Especially in the pre-modern world, a pilgrim had to be a little crazy even to consider setting out from home. Because traveling was so treacherous, pilgrims would put their affairs in order before they left. They would pay outstanding debts, write their wills, and make provisions for dependents. In the Middle Ages, it was traditional that Christian pilgrims would be blessed by a priest and anointed with holy, holy water. 
If they died on the trip, they'd be ready to meet their maker, having squared both earthly and spiritual accounts. The rigors and dangers of pilgrimage included robbers, rivers that had to be crossed on tipsy ferries, high mountain passes battered by winds and snowstorms, ocean journeys plagued by seasickness and shipwrecks, and overnights in inns that were riddled with vermin, lice, and bedbugs. Anyone who's ever complained about hotel accommodations on a package tour should contemplate what it was like to travel for most of human history. Such trips were sometimes undertaken as a form of penance, forgive me, Lord, for sleeping with my brother-in-law, or to fulfill a promise made to God after the fulfillment of a prayer, thanks so much for my recovery from smallpox. If pilgrims suffered some along the way, all the better, for the experience likely made them realize their dependence upon divine providence. We should never forget that travel and travail share the same root. In the West, the popularity of pilgrimage has waxed and waned through the centuries, flourishing during the Middle Ages and declining during the Reformation and the Age of Enlightenment. But even at its lowest point, it never disappeared completely, and today we may be entering a new era of pilgrimage, despite, or perhaps because of, the growing disillusionment with organized religion. Especially in Christianity, people are finding on the road what they cannot find in churches. And one of the truths of pilgrimage is this. Often, its most important part is not the destination, but what happens on the way. Thank you. Um, as Willie said, I'm really a war correspondent, so I feel a bit of a fraud uh, talking about travel writing. And actually, I, usually I fly into places that people are leaving, so I hope that doesn't say anything about border. <laughs> the place that I've covered most since I started out as a journalist 30 years ago, when I was very young, um, is Afghanistan. And I first went there when the Russians were there. So I'm going to read a little bit from my book, Farewell Kabul, which spans those 30 years. And this bit starts on Christmas Eve 2001, after the Taliban had been toppled, supposedly. I sat on the roof of the Mustafa Hotel on the seat of an old Soviet MiG fighter jet and looked out over Kabul, feeling happy. Happy endings are few and far between in my foreign correspondent world, where we fly in to report war, misery, and disaster in time for our deadlines, then out again back to our comfortable lives disturbed only by an occasional nightmare or sad memory that floods in unexpectedly to darken a moment. The hills all around were dotted with tiny wattle houses in squares of beige and sky blue, melding into each other like a brack painting. There was Swimming Pool Hill, named after the Olympic-sized concrete swimming pool that the Russians had built on its top long empty and last used by Taliban to push blindfolded homosexuals to their deaths off the diving tower. TV mountain with a broken antenna and littered with rocket casings from years as a major battleground for rival Mujahideen groups. And Cannon Hill, where until all the fighting started, an old man would fire off a cannon every day at noon, a tradition begun in the 19th century by the Iron King, Abdul Rahman, to give his unruly countrymen a sense of time. Along the tops, I could see the remains of this old city walls picked out in relief, starting and ending at the Balahisar Fortress, an ancient polygon of walls which crowned Lion's Gate Monument, and managed to be both crumbling and imposing. The name means high fort, and from this perch for centuries ruled Afghan kings, some of whom ended up in its dungeons, and long ago, some of the world's mightiest conquerors. Among them was Tamerlane, the Tartar despot who leveled cities from Moscow to Baghdad and built towers from the skulls of the people. And Baba, the first Mughal emperor who adored Kabul for its gardens, where he counted 32 different types of tulips. Baba loved this city, and I loved it too. Hello, my sister, what gives? Wise Faizi, the hotel's manager, was a 31-year-old Afghan with a fast-talking New Jersey patois 
like the car salesman he had once been. The Fonz of Kabul, we called him. His family had owned the Mustafa for years until it was seized by communists around the time of the Soviet invasion in 1979, and they had fled to America when he was just a child. They had recently returned to Afghanistan and had been in the process of converting the Mustafa into a gemstone, a money exchange, when 9-11 happened, and Kabul unexpectedly became the focus of world attention. So they quickly turned it back into a hotel, just in time for the flood of journalists, though with not enough time to actually make the rooms comfortable. Chai Sabs, Wise handed me a mug of green tea. Tashakur, I thanked him. It had about as much taste as dishwater, but it was warm, tendrils of steam rising in the frigid air, and I cupped my hands gratefully around the sides. Still working on the espresso machine, he apologized. He found his home country harder to get used to than we nomad journalists did, and often talked wistfully of Dunkin' Donuts and Domino's Pizza. A coffee machine would actually be useless in Kabul, given how rarely we had electricity, and that when it came, it was in gadget-destroying bursts. But if anyone could get one, it would be wise. He'd already turned one of the rooms into a makeshift gym, complete with dumbbells bought from a warlord, and decorated with posters of his hero, Al Pacino. <laughs> Why has it even managed to get hold of the only convertible in Kabul? A 1968 Chevy Camaro, which had belonged to one of the Afghan princes before the king was deposed, and he had taken me for a spin. We'd had a glorious afternoon, driving around the ruins of Kabul, children waving in astonishment, carpet beaters jumping out of the way, and men wobbling on their bikes at the sight of a foreign woman in an open-top car and headscarf, fancying herself as Grace Kelly. <laughs> Next, he'd promised us a bar, and he was organizing a Christmas dinner, for unbelievably, he'd found someone in the Panjshir Valley who raised turkeys. Um, Wise uh, also kept pigeons in a glass coop in the open courtyard in the center of the hotel. Pigeon flying was popular in Kabul, where houses had flat roofs, and people trained them to take off as if by remote control, then loop the loop by waving a stick with a piece of black cloth on the end. As always in Afghanistan, it wasn't a benign pastime. The real aim was to try to get someone's rival flock to land on your rooftop. You could usually tell pigeon trainers by their beak-scarred hands. Why can't you fly kites instead of pigeons, I asked. You of all people should like the pigeons, Wise laughed. When they fly, they always follow the lead of a female. The music stopped, its owner perhaps paid off by some exasperated journalist, and I could hear peals of children's laughter. Down on the pavement, some local street kids were jumping and diving, trying to catch the snow, which was starting to fall more thickly. Soon I would be driven inside to one of the freezing glass partition cells with metal bars on the outside that passed for rooms at the Mustafa. But for a moment, I wanted to enjoy the rare sight of children playing in this country which had seen more than 20 years of war. I'm just going to read a little bit from going back to that hotel. So that was 2001. Um, I went back in 2014 when the foreign troops were leaving. Afghanistan, um, or ending their combat operations, and I was in Kabul. The night was falling quickly, and just as they always had in Afghanistan, the foreigners were going away. It was time for me to go home too. Before I left, I went to the bazaar to buy a dented pomegranate, and the shopkeeper charged me 100 Afghanis, more than a pound, which we both knew was too much. Winter was coming, and it was turning cold, rain turning to sleet, and roads turning to mud. The traffic spluttered forward in fits and starts. Suddenly, I realized we were in Interior Ministry Road. Stop, I commanded the driver. He tried to tell me he was not allowed to stop, that it was a dangerous place. But I was in foreign correspondent mode and already out of the car. Round the corner was the Mustafa Hotel, and at its doorway was standing Shabadin, the tall Uzbek guard, just as he had been when we were so happy to find the hotel in 2001. His face lit up in recognition. How is everyone, I asked. Not good, he replied. 
You know, we say the devil fell in Kabul when he was cast out of heaven. He told me that after the hotel's manager, Wise Faizi, had committed suicide, his father died of grief. Then his brother, Mustafa, borrowed a lot of money from Northern Alliance people and could not repay it. So they came at night and put him in Polycherky prison. The hotel had then been divided between creditors into three separate parts. Just one floor is owned by 14 different people, said Shabuddin. There's still a picture of you and Wise in his car upstairs. That was such a happy day. He always called you his sister. I asked him to take me to see the photograph, but Shabuddin shook his head. It's not like before, he said. It's bad people staying. What about the pigeons, I asked. Are they still there in the courtyard? Yes, he replied. Only a few, as no one feeds them or flies them. People have TV now on Facebook instead of pigeons and kites. Around the corner, I could see my driver was being moved on by the police and was gesturing angrily for me to come. But I didn't want to leave. Now when I looked up at the Balahissa fort, a white intelligence blimp flew over the top, a strange clash of sentries. You foreigners always just pass through, said Shabuddin. We don't know what will happen, but I am happier that you came than if you had not. Thank you. Probably take off from where Laurie left off on holy places and uh, and pilgrimages, and it, I think one of the holiest places on earth uh, is Jerusalem, uh, holy to many 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 faiths. Uh, I happen to be uh, stationed in Israel for four years, and those of you who have been to Jerusalem or read about it would know that it is home to many many hospices uh, of different faiths where pilgrims uh, have have been going there. But what we may not know is that there is an Indian hospice, uh, which really connects travels of Indian pilgrims to uh, the holy city for about 800 years. So the book that I wrote called Indians at Herod's Gate was essentially about tracing the story about the Indian hospice through the story of the 85-year-old Palestinian, half Palestinian, half Indian man who is still today the director of the uh, Indian hospice, and in the process, uh, I try to tell something about what you feel in Jerusalem, what you see in it. So, uh, this this piece is called "Spies, Diplomats, Authors, and Romantics." Dusk is falling, and the shop shutters are coming down as I walk back from Herod's Gate towards the American Colony Hotel down Saladin Street past the old stone houses of Arab Jerusalem's notables, past the private cemetery where many members of the illustrious Husseini family lie buried under the tall trees. The American Colony Hotel lies just east of the fault line between East and West Jerusalem. A hundred meters away from 1948 to 1967, used to run the barbed wires of no man's land between Israel and Jordan. Two different worlds carried on their daily lives, separated by the barbed wire, a concrete wall built by the Jordanians and the occasional landmine. Two eminent men whom I got to know and admire immensely during have written their childhoods in this divided Jerusalem. The Palestinian philosopher Sari Nusebe and the famous Israeli writer Amos Oz, who grew up on either side of the divide, separated only by destiny and a few hundred meters. Nusebe's childhood home was just across the road from the American colony, a house with Persian carpets, gold embossed academic degrees on the wall, crystal decanters for after dinner drinks, and dozens of finely buffed tennis trophies. From this house, the young Sari would stare across the rock and thistle of no man's land and the forbidden territory that lay beyond, at the strange looking buses and knots of bearded Orthodox Jews with black coats and dangling side girls who inhabited the religious Haradim neighborhood of Mir Shirim. His young imagination was fired by what he heard about the other side, the elegant shops on Jaffa Road, the Gary Cooper westerns at the Edison Cinema, 
the villas in the old neighborhoods, and how from the hills to the west you could see the Mediterranean. On the 25th of December, Sari would make his way to the nearby Mantelbaum Gate, Jerusalem's checkpoint Charlie, which would open only on Christmas Day to allow pilgrims from the other side to visit the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. From the other side, Amos Oz's exceptional imagination would allow him to stare wide-eyed at the other Jerusalem, a city of old cypress trees that were more black than green, streets of stone walls, interlaced grills, cornices and dark walls, the alien, silent, aloof, shrouded Jerusalem, the Abyssinian Muslim pilgrim Ottoman city, the strange missionary city of crusaders and templars, the Greek, Armenian, Italian, brooding, Anglican, Greek, Orthodox city. The barbed wire was rolled up many years ago and all of Jerusalem annexed by Israel, but the virtual barrier between East and West still remains. One has only to turn into Nablus Road towards the American Colony Hotel to know that one is in the Arab East. There is something in the air that leaves no doubt. Playing with these thoughts, I step into the hotel, once the home of a Husseini notable and his four wives, and then of the Spaffords, an American Christian evangelical family that moved to Jerusalem sometimes towards the end of the 19th century. Aided by Swiss consultants, the descendants of the family turned the house into the famous hotel. Every romantic, tragic, or historic figure of the Middle East, from T.E. Lawrence to Churchill to Glub Pasha, appears to have stayed there, not to mention people like Bob Dylan, Peter O'Toole, and John Steinbeck. Understandably, it is now a gathering hole, as a newspaper article colorfully puts it, of spies, diplomats, authors, and romantics. It is doused in old world colonial charm with its history all pinned up in pictures and news clippings on the walls. Besides which, it has a well-stocked bookshop and even better stocked bar. During the winter months, the bar is tucked away into a cozy cellar and in the summer it moves out into the scented garden. The bookshop is run by Munza Fami, a Palestinian American of infinite charm. On my several trips to Jerusalem, he was the first person I would stop to meet for a cup of Arabic coffee, for a browse through his shelves, for a conversation that inevitably revealed some new angle, or if not, at least brought a smile. His straw hat at a rakish angle on his head, green framed spectacles in hand, he mixed easily with foreign correspondents and diplomats. A few minutes of conversation and he would, with an uncanny ability, pick out, pick out just the book for you, a book that you would be hard put to refuse. It was a rare occasion when I walked out of his shop without buying something or the other, a book, a Palestine poster, a moleskin notebook. Such was his charm. And he was never short on the one-liners. One day when I offered him chewing gum, he responded, no thank you, I'm Catholic. <laughs> it's too early to go to bed, so I head towards Munzer's bookshop across the courtyard. The shop is doing brisk business. You're open late tonight, I say. Yesterday I was open till 10.30 at night. I hope it will be even later today. Now it's too hot for people to come and buy books during the day. I beat him to the question. Drink, I ask. He hesitates a moment and then quickly makes a decision. He signals to his dark-eyed shop assistant. Hana, will you? She takes a seat behind the counter and we walk into the garden. A boy in a black t-shirt is lighting the little tea lights on each table. The call for the Maghrib prayer of the evening rises from the mosque just behind the hotel. It floats along with the pleasant breeze over the low tables with the usual mix of foreign correspondents, diplomats and representatives of international agencies who lounge among the bushes, glasses of draft beer and red wine between them. It's pleasant to sit there with him and distinguish the scents rising from the bushes and trees, sage, rosemary pine, the one that has the capacity to push away all others is lavender. It will stay on my hand for a long time because I accidentally brushed a bush as I pushed back my chair. It is in this garden, surrounded by this celebration of herbal scents, that I managed to scrape through Nazir's formal politeness one evening. We have to write this story, Nazir, your father's story. What is the plan, he asks, playing for time. No plan, a simple story, your father, his father, the Indian hospice how it all began, what happened during the centuries, and if we can, what happened during your father's lifetime. 
He doesn't take long to make up his mind. I will help you, he says. You will have my full cooperation. We shake on it over the low table with its wavering tea light. And he soon goes home, his quick short steps echoing down the darkening Saladin street. I don't know then how he will help me. But I learn later from his wife and sisters that our little conversation in the twilight garden bar changed the pattern of his life for months. He began to steal time from the family, spending it in winning the trust of the librarian at the Islamic University of Abu Dis, an Arab town just beyond the Mount of Olives, where the old records of the Sharia court are kept in file cabinets on wheels. And he stayed up many nights, sifting through the documents he found, struggling with the Ottoman Arabic, picking out the slightest reference to the Indian hospice. And every once in a while, he found a little odd-shaped piece that fitted in the large jigsaw puzzle called the past. Thank you. Oh, that every country had diplomats as literate as India. <laughs> <laughs> This is staying in the Middle East. Most of my writing has been about India, where I've lived for the last 30 years. But this is a, a, an, an outlier, I suppose, uh, an account of a journey um, through the Christian Middle East, which I did in 1994, a book called From the Holy Mountain. And this is a section about driving into Lebanon, which was just uh, at the end of the Lebanese civil war, when it was, in a sense, the reverse situation today, when uh, today you go to the Middle East and Lebanon is this little um, sort of pleasure-loving uh, oasis amid the, the, the terrible destruction that's gone on in Syria. In 1994, it was the opposite. Uh, Syria was an oasis of calm, uh, and uh, Lebanon was a mess. Uh, and this was my first trip into Lebanon since the civil war. Ten minutes took us out of Damascus, and soon the Thunderbird was burning into the scrub beyond. A further 40 minutes, and we were heading into the foothills of Mount Lebanon. A convoy of Syrian T-72 tanks crunched down the highway in the opposite direction. Assad waved goodbye from a hoarding. The road wound steeply upwards, corkscrewing through pine trees and slopes of gorse, and suddenly we were there. The Syrian frontier post, a rambling collection of concrete huts huddled among the pines. On the concrete cash, crash barriers uh, beside the Syrian pockets where the police and the army would camp, the otherwise ubiquitous posters of the Lebanese Prime Minister, Rafi Kariri, all jowls and double chins like some corpulent Italian waiter, were replaced by Assad family iconography familiar from Syria. Assad in his paratrooper fatigues, Assad the general in his peak cap, Assad the statesman in international pinstripe, Assad's dead son Basil in his trademark reflector shades. Sometimes the hagiography became more whimsical. One Syrian pillbox had Assad and Basil transformed into the idiom of hate Ashbury flower children, with scowling faces of both men hanging from stalks of brightly, naively painted sunflowers. At other times, the iconography of the different power brokers of Lebanon was strangely intermingled. So the pinups of Assad, Basil, Hariri, and a brace of turbaned Iranian mullahs popular among the Shia of the Bekaa would all appear together on a single crash barrier, sometimes in the unlikely, unlikely company of a leggy Lebanese chanteurs or some sequined Egyptian movie starlet. Perhaps strangest of all were the unlikely lines of hoardings that rose above the forbidding ruins along the highway. A smiling Claudia Schiffer stretched out leopard-like in Salvatore Ferragamo next to a yellow sandstone French colonial villa so riddled with great round shrapnel holes it resembled an, out, an outside slice of Ermenthal. The Marlborough cowboy in his 10-gallon hat and herd of steers beamed over an apocalyptic wasteland of shattered tower blocks. A metal tube of body mist and boko san effort set against the black carbon skeleton of twisted metal that had once been a filling station. From the bottom of the Bekaa, we crawled sluggishly up a narrow ridge, a single lane of traffic moving slowly uphill behind a pair of massive Syrian tank transporters until, at the top, 
We found ourselves looking from an unexpected eminence down through the fog of smoke over the ruins of Beirut to the shattered mirror of the Mediterranean beyond. The Thunderbird's outsized bonnet swung over the hog's back of the ridge and we were off. Down we twisted through a series of S-bends under the ruins past the posters. Salvatore Ferragamo Port Iver, an Ottoman villa pockmarked with small arms fire. Valentino an exclusivite a Bible black hearse parked outside a hearse. Martini, right here, right now, two decapitated palm trees. Calvin by Calvin Klein, a dead tank. Cool Budweiser on tap, a bombed out hospital. Lucky Strike, a cluster of skyscrapers so pockmarked with shrapnel, they look like a mouthful of severely rotten teeth. Versatile by Versace. It was like a morality tale, spiraling downwards through one of the world's greatest monuments to human frailty, a great vortex of greed and envy, resentment and intolerance, hatred and materialism, a five-mile-long slalom of shell holes and designer labels, heavy artillery and glossy boutiques. Like a modern updating of a Byzantine apocalypse, it was the confusion that was most hell-like. Ayatollah Khomeini, hands raised in blessing, shared a billboard with a bottle of American aftershave. Below, huge American cars, Thunderbirds, Chevrolets, Corvettes, roared past building sites where monstrous machines, thickly carapaced like metal-clad cockroaches, moved earth, demolished ruins, dug holes. Occasionally there was an explosion and a small mushroom cloud of dust as a doomed tower block crashed to the earth, nudged by one of the grunting metal beetles below. As we corkscrewed through the coastal plain, the temperature rose and a thick fog of pollution hovered among the ruined buildings like a pall of gun smoke. Here and there rose a scattering of kitschy new neo-baroque villas with red roofs and marble balustrades, the product presumably of looting, the arms trade or the drugs, for precious few legitimate fortunes have been made in this country in the past two decades. But as we drove on, deeper and deeper into the shattered city, such signs of prosperity became rarer. We headed on faster now, on a potholed freeway, hotter and hotter, fuggier and fuggier, more polluted, more wrecked. Yet for all the destruction, in some places the shrapnel marks were strangely beautiful, like a Kandinsky abstract, a perfect peppering of dots and dashes, a tribute to the arms dealer's art a hail of metal perfectly distributed across a plaster canvas. Even the hideous ruins of 60s blocks came to hold a strange fascination. Some appeared as if newly built, only the puncture mark of a massive shell hole through the lateral wall of an apartment indicated what had happened to the interior and its occupants. Others were utterly wrecked. A single wall remained like a gravestone to mark the whereabouts of an entire tower block. At a distance, an oblique exclamation of concrete and a tangle of metal rods, the building's top story would remain where it had landed in the aftermath of the blast and the collapse. Strangest of all were those blocks where the collapse concrete stories were now folded down on top of each other like a pile of newly pressed shirts that had been left hanging off the edge of an ironing board. Thick layers of tons of pre-stressed concrete curved over the edge of a hundred foot drops like soft folds of fine cotton. Despite the mess, astonishingly, the great majority of these wrecked apartments were still inhabited. In some whose walls were so eroded by shrapnel that they resembled a pile of chronically warm-eaten wood, I would notice washing hanging up to dry on a line, or perhaps a shadowy figure taking the air on a half-collapsed balcony. As twilight fell over the ruined city, Pale and ghostly lights began to come on in one after another of these apparently abandoned blocks. The ruins, it seemed, were vertical shanty towns, makeshift billets for impoverished Shia laborers or homeless Palestinians, all rushing to fill the vacuum left by the rehoused rich. Most had patched up their flats with pieces of corrugated iron or slashes of black plastic sheeting, but many others, perhaps the newest arrivals, had not. As we drove past, I found I could look into the illuminated interiors of these people's flats, 
for they were missing walls or had such huge shell holes that entire suites of rooms were opened up for public inspection, like some sort of outsized advent calendar. As we drove, I saw a man getting dressed in his flat, nonchalantly pulling on his jeans. It was an unremarkable, everyday scene, except that the wall of his flat had entirely disappeared, so that he was framed by the black concrete superstructure around him, lit up like a cinema screen in a dark room. Thank you. So we have 10 minutes to pull these diverse threads together. Um, and particularly, I think the question I'd love to ask the panelists one by one um, is, what is the role of the travel writer today? Here we live in an age when each one of us can go home to our laptops and switch on Google Maps. We can Google any place we want in the world and learn information. It's, it's a radically different thing from Ibn Jubayr describing for the first time the uh, Norman Sicily or Marco Polo telling us about China or, or even 19th century explorers talking about Central Asia. What is it that we as travel writers have today that can, we can still offer uh, in a world where travel, anyone can travel anywhere? Can we go around each in, in turn and just give a an art, short answer to that? Sure, I think travel writers give a window into places that people themselves aren't able to go or that maybe will want to go at some point and it just gives a broader view into our, our increasingly global world today. And that's coming faster and faster and faster. On, on Polar Expeditions, we, we blog every day through satellite phones. We're able to send photo and text or audio content back to our websites or back to whatever media outlets are, are following us. So uh, as opposed to the past where people would work on articles and then get them out or work on books and the news travel lots more slowly, today people can follow along uh, in real time, more or less. So it has some of that living vicariously through someone else's journey in real time. I think that that's a big change that's happening and will continue to happen. Uh, I, my hope is that travel writing is, is an aspirational thing, that it, it moves people to think differently about the world and to get out of wherever they are and, and go visit and, and travel themselves. Uh, Personally, I, when I travel, I don't like to read all that much about the place I'm going. I want to get some tips, but I don't, I don't want to have too much information in my head. I want to have my own experience and not just follow a guidebook or somebody else's take on the place that I am spending time in. And I, I kind of cherish my own, own, own imagination, own sense of discovery. And I think that with, with so much information out there today, that has completely changed the landscape of what people expect when they travel and, and their own journey as a, as a means to itself. I think we travel uh, to change our lives and to change our hearts. Uh, and so I think the role of a travel writer who focuses on spiritual sites like I do is to say what moved me. Uh, and to say this might move you too. Even if you don't go exactly to the same place, you might go to someplace similar. And one of the points that I try to make in my book is that such places exist everywhere. Holy sites are everywhere. You don't have to get on an airplane or even into a car. Uh, and so I think that, for me, I, I think travel writing can often, um, I try to, I try, okay, I'm gonna, interrupt myself. I try to travel with a sense of wonder and in my book I try to impart that sense of wonder, that sort of almost naive sense of isn't this beautiful or this is really surprising or it's amazing what this person once did here once. Uh, and so I try to take people along with me to experience how I experienced that place but always with a sense that you could do this too. Uh, and so I think travel writers really perform a valuable function. In a way, I sort of do travel writing as a kind of self-help, I guess. Because uh, honestly, most things can be solved by a trip, I think. Um, <laughs> Solvitor ambulatum, what was that phrase? <laughs> yes, yeah. it Saint is solved by walking. St. Augustine said that. Yeah, yeah. It is solved by walking. 
<laughs> and I firmly believe that. You two are, are not strictly travel writers in all different ways. You have, you have day jobs, like us, but uh, um, you, nonetheless, you, you, you do write about the world around you. What, 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 in, in a world where people can still travel, why do you bother, uh, first of all, Christina, then Navtej? Well, I think it, you know, it's not just about describing the place. I think from all the readings that you heard from us, it's about more about the experience that, there. Um, and actually, as John said, I mean, one of the ways that my job as a journalist has changed enormously from when I started out is technology. So when I started out, you know, I would go off to places. So Afghanistan had no phones even, right, let alone mobile phones or internet or all the things that we have now. So I would go for weeks and then go back to Pakistan and then have to bribe an international telephone operator or telex, you remember telex operators, to um, send my story out. And photographers used to have to go to the airport and send their films on planes. So it was very different. And in some ways, I think there was some value to that because by the time you actually kind of committed words to paper, you had actually spent a lot of time and really got to know the place. Whereas now, um, as John said, I mean, he's blogging from the middle of nowhere. We, I can send stories from the top of a mountain in the, min, um, in the Hindu Kush or in the middle of the Iraqi desert. And sometimes that means you're much more vulnerable to propaganda or getting things wrong because you're not you're sort of sending it before you've really had time to think about it and let the experience sink in. So I, I think the best travel writing is, is a much more considered thing than that. Um, and I was a little bit taken aback yesterday afternoon. I don't know any of you that were here for the session of Ambassador uh, Viraj Swarup, who wrote the, the book that became Slumdog Millionaire, saying that he'd never been to the, the slum that he wrote about, that he just used Google. <laughs> and um, <laughs> so, because um, I always think that you have to actually go there to give a sense of the smell and the, um, what it's really like. But obviously, he did a very good job without doing that. So. Well, I think it's important to distinguish travel writer is not a travel agent. You know? I, so no amount of description or Google Maps or tourist pamphlets can actually replace uh, travel writing. In my view, I think travel writing, good travel writing, is perhaps one of the most difficult kind of writings uh, uh, to do. Because but a travel writer brings to a, a place or a journey a lot more. He brings his sensitivity. He brings his sense of history. He brings his ability to have conversations. He brings his, his sense of humor. And I think the best of travel writing, I mean, there's, there's no amount of uh, uh, geography books which can teach you or tell you what Patagonia is, uh, but Bruce Chatwin can in Patagonia, or Burton, Burton's book on the road to Oxiana, uh, uh, or for that matter, William Dalrymple on <laughs> from the Holy Mountain. Uh, I, I think these, the best of travel writing, I mean, if you still look at Road to Oxiana, despite having all the knowledge about Afghanistan and Middle East, etc., that whole sense of bringing together a, an entire civilization through a journey and, and to doing it not in a didactic fashion, but to do it sensitively, humorously and lightly. Uh, I think that's, that's, the, that's the way I see best of travel writing. I've just Googled a, a quote here, um, which I rather love, <laughs> from Jonathan Rabin. Uh, and he says, old travelers grumpily complain that travel is now dead and the world has become a suburb. They are quite wrong. Lulled by familiar resemblances between, the all, between all the unimportant things, they miss the brute differences in everything of importance. And I think there's a lot to be said for that, that uh, it's true that uh, you can go to Lhasa or to Jaipur or to Kabul and find Nikes on store in all three or, and, uh, and probably Big Macs in two of the three. Um, uh, and, and whatever the, the chicken equivalent in India is. <laughs> but the, um, 
the differences between human beings and the things that link them are still matters for a writer to explore wherever they are in the world. So to give an example, Jaipur, where this uh, festival originates, is, is in many ways a very, very modern, extraordinary town. There are two universities. It's, it's now a city of almost a million people. It's a huge uh, uh, state capital. But 15 years ago, an educated middle-class woman who was from, had passed out of Jaipur University committed sati uh, and allowed herself to be uh, bullied or pressurized or whatever um, into jumping on the funeral pyre of her dead husband. Now, to me, that's a fascinating thing because she was not a village girl. She was not uh, a girl who was uneducated from the, the boonies. She was, she'd had a university education. She probably wore Nikes. Uh, and yet, behind the apparent similarity, there are these huge cultural things that still link but also divide us. Uh, and uh, these are the, these hidden differences that lie behind the superficial uh, similarities of globalization seem to be the sort of thing that's very interesting for a travel writer to explore. Christina? Yes, I, I would agree with that. I've actually, you, for some reason, as you were talking about, I was thinking about Kabul fried chicken, which is the, um, the Afghan takeoff of Kentucky fried chicken, KFC. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, for all... Uh, you see the um, Western things arriving in some of these places that you know you, you don't have to go very far to see the, the real culture still. One of the places that I've been traveling to a lot in my job, but also actually went there on holiday with my family because I found it so fascinating was Iran, which is you know a place which has been sort of cut off from many of us for quite a long time and um, I highly uh, recommend going there because it, it's a country where people are so uh, connected to their history, um, which is true in Afghanistan too. I think that's what people often say to me, why, why do you keep going back to this country that is so, has so many problems and everybody trying to kill each other? Um, and, you know, it's a country where everybody's a storyteller and I love that, that you know, it's very... Um, low literacy, but a uh, huge tradition of um, uh, oral uh, uh, history. And people talk about battles that happened 100 years ago as though they happened yesterday. So I think that we have a lot to learn from going to different places. Sorry, do you want to have the last word? Yes, briefly. Um, I, I would say, too, that another reason to travel in this age where there's so many divisions, especially between religious groups, is that when we visit places that are, are sacred to other cultures, we learn something about them as well as ourselves. And a pilgrim is someone who really is, in a way, um, stateless. You know, they are, they are on their own, they are open. Uh, and I think divisions can be lessened by people traveling to these places, traveling on pilgrimage, walking in the Camino together, et cetera. So it's another reason why I'm passionate about travel. Uh, especially to holy sites. Thank you. Thank you.